Hey guys, my name's Nate. Um, wanted to take a moment to intro this video. It's going to be of a close friend of mine and Amy's uh, from Indiana. Um, this series, we're, I'm excited about this series because we're going to be looking at um, the idea of death. But our hope by the end of this is we're going to reorient our thoughts on the idea of death to it not being something that we dread and we live really quickly right now and just spend up our spend our time now and one day we'll, we'll get there but we want to look at it and we want to recognize that it's not the end that it's the beginning as long as we're in Christ but more than that that it also speaks into our life right now and it changes us and it compels us to live right now that's what that's our hope and we're, we're talking about the idea of thinking about our last breath our breaths are numbered and one day we'll breathe our last and we could just we could talk about and we could just describe what that would be like but we have a story um, from a, a really good friend of ours Katie Schmidt from Indiana. Um, she, she lives there with her family and her parents came down to visit, um, to, um, vacation here in, in Orlando. And, um, while her parents were here, her father, um, came down with COVID-19. Um, he, he came down with the virus and he was admitted and he was in the hospital for a long period. And there, um, they didn't think that he was going to make it. He went through some really, really difficult times. I want her to share a story, but there were, uh, she shared with us some videos of him taking breaths while he was on the ventilator and this, every breath was just labored. And it's just, he had to fight for every single one. And it was a really difficult, uh, dark time, but we wanted, um, to not just talk about facing that question. What do we do if we are considering we're, we're, we're getting close to that last breath. What do we do? How do we respond to that? We just wanted you to see their perspective and their story. Here's Katie's story. Hi, I'm Katie Schmidt. In March, my dad was diagnosed with COVID-19. He was in the hospital for over 40 days. 22 of those days, um, he was on a ventilator. The awesome ICU nurses um, would FaceTime me and my mom and my siblings um, so that we'd be able to see my dad even though he was heavily sedated. Um, I'll be honest with you, it was hard to see him in that condition. The ventilator was really noisy and it was so unnatural and um, mechanical to see his chest rise and fall that the machine was breathing for him. We knew that the vent was giving his lungs the rest that they needed so that they could heal and repair. It looked pretty grim for my dad. Um, my parents have a very deep faith um, and they put their trust in Jesus and we knew that all this was in God's hands. And we knew that if my dad could speak, he would say that he was healed either way, whether that was to go be with Jesus or more time on this earth. But I'm happy to report that he is um, fully recovered. Every day he's getting stronger and there were so many around the world praying for him. Um, many of you were praying for him, and we are so thankful for that. Thank you, Katie, for sharing your story uh, with us and your dad's story. And we as a church family have been praying for him, and so we're so grateful that, that God has been gracious to you, your mom, and the rest of your family to give you some more time with, with your dad. Uh, but even more so, we, we are so encouraged with just his, his heart and his attitude and his love for the Lord and also just the peace that he had with the promises of God that, that God was going to heal him, uh, whether it was uh, here or whether he was going to be with, with Christ. And so that is really encapsulates the heart of this new series that we're doing called Last Breath over the next few weeks where we talk about this really difficult and hard topic of death. And it's something that we don't usually want to talk about. It's something that we kind of want to ignore until we absolutely have to, to deal with it. But here's the thing. What's interesting is that our God, our God talks a lot about death. In fact, it's probably one of the biggest topics, if not the biggest topic he talks about all throughout scripture. In fact, he uses the word death or dead or some kind of word that, um, that's similar to that almost 3,000 times throughout Scripture. So he talks a lot about it. In fact, he also uses the word heaven over 900 times throughout Scripture, talking about uh, another place, a different place than where we live in here and now. And so these are big topics to God. These are very important things to him um, because what we'll see is that God desires for us to really want to live and live life to the fullest. Now, that seems kind of weird, doesn't it? That doesn't it seem kind of strange? But here's the thing when it comes to with death and what God wants to convey to you and to convey to us as we go through this series is as we talk about this, he doesn't want us to get depressed about it 
In fact, he wants us something very contrary to that. He wants us to have a life that is free, a life of peace, a life of anticipation of something even better that's coming up. And so what we see, even through the whole Christian movement, we see at the very apex of the, of the Christian movement is death, the death of one Jesus Christ. But not just his death, but his resurrection. And one of the things that we learn from our God and what we will learn over the next few weeks is that in order for us to fully live and live life to the fullest, we have to come to a place of death. Just as Jesus Christ died and through his death, there was a resurrection. So here is the big idea for this message and for the rest of the series is this. And this is what we want you to kind of think about and stew on over the next few weeks is that the way that you think about death directly impacts the way that you think about life. That's right. The way that you think about death directly impacts the way that you think about life. Now, here's a caveat, though. You may have some sort of, you know, you know, theological thinking about death. You may have heard some messages about death and, you know, going to church and all that. And you may have had some, some talks or philosophical talks with friends in, in the university and all that sort of stuff. But here's the thing. What you truly believe about death really influences how you think about life and how you live your life. And that could be very subconscious as well. You know, you could be thinking, well, you know, I believe that there is eternal life. You know, you kind of say those words because that's what Christians do. But what do you really think? What goes on really deep in, within your heart and within your mind? Because that operating system is what's going to have an influence in the way that you think about life and the way that you live your life. Let me kind of put it this way. Now, if, if you think that all there is to this world is just this, that at our last breath, when we take our last breath, and everything goes dark, that's it. No more, nothing else, that's all. That is going to profoundly influence the way that you think about life and the way that you live life now. In fact, it's going to create a lot of despair and fear when you come to that realization that this is the last breath, that this is it. And there can be despair and fear of the last breath of somebody that you love. That this is it. There's no more. There's nothing more to their life. There's nothing more to my own life. And that can create a lot of depression and anxiety through that. Not only that, though, but it can also create a lot of self-centeredness, a lot of selfishness in the sense of, hey, if this is all that there is, then I'm going to get the most out of this life as I can possibly get for me. And so I'm going to consume, I'm going to live as comfortable as possible, I'm going to do whatever I believe gives me the full benefit. And sacrificing for other people, why would I sacrifice for someone else if this is the only life that I have? Why would I cut my life short so they can live a longer life when this is all that there is? In fact, when we have that mentality and that thought, we tend to become very selfish and self-consuming. And it's not just about an individual, it's also about a culture. Cultures who have a very uh, clear view of that this is all that there is, there is no God, there is no afterlife, live a very much a very self-centered, consumed life. In fact, willing to sacrifice other people for ourselves rather than what we see with Christ who says, go and sacrifice your life for other people. But why should I do that if this is all that there is? And even as a Christian, you could be a Christian and you maybe even think, well, you know, this is, you know, there is, I believe that there is an afterlife and that there is more to than just this life. But if you believe deep down within your heart that this is the best that it's going to be, you're still going to, you know, struggle with fear and anxiety. You're also going to be self-centered. Hey, this is the, all the life that I have in this one earth. Before I go and to meet my maker, I'm going to make the most of this life for me. I'm going to have my bucket list. And so I'm going to go do the things that, that benefit me with this one life that I have, rather than live for God's bucket list. And what's his bucket list? That all men and all women and all children would come into a reconciled relationship with him and with each other. And through that, though, in order to have this, this love for each other and love for our Lord, there is going to be sacrifice. There are going to be things that are going to be uncomfortable. But if I think that this is as good as it's going to get, then I'm going to live for this life and this life alone. Or if I believe that Jesus Christ is offering me not only eternal life, but he's offering me even better life forever, 
that I'm going to live a life of anticipation of the best that is going to come before me. And I'm going to be more willing to live a life of love and a life of sacrifice for other people if I know that this is just a little blip on the eternal radar. This is a small little piece of life. And so, and this is just um, a small piece by which to sacrifice for the love of other people that will have eternal ramifications. That um, And there will be eternal life by which God will just shower us with just incredible riches of his love. We can live a life that's more sacrificial. In fact, we see that with Jesus Christ, right? Jesus died at a younger age. He was never married. He, he didn't uh, experience all the, the things of this world, but he was okay with that. Why? Because he knew that there was something better, something bigger that God had planned, not only for him, for, but for all of us who are in Christ. So the question is, is, is why death then? Why did God allow death? Why is, what's the purpose of of it. If God is sovereign, he's all knowing all that, why did he let death come into this world? Well, in order to answer that question, we have to go all the way back to the beginning when God created man. When God created Adam and Eve, he created them and he said that it was good. In fact, all of creation was perfect. It was wonderful. It was beautiful. It was great. But there was a time when, when God said to Adam in verse in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. If you have a Bible, you can flip over there. But in Genesis 2, 15 and 17, it says this, The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over, the, over it. But the Lord God warned him, and he said this, he says, You may freely eat of the fruit of every tree in the garden. So stop right here real quick. In other words, what God was saying to Adam, man, you can have everything. You can eat as much as you want from every tree there, the tree of life over there. Have at it. Eat all that you want. But here's the deal. Accept the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, if you eat its fruit, you will surely what? You will surely die, okay? And so basically what, what God was at, um, saying to Adam was really he was posing a question to him. He was saying to Adam, Adam, do you trust me? Do you trust me that I love you? Do you trust me that I have your best interests in mind by which when I ask you and to do things or tell you to do things, you know that it's coming from, from a God who loves you and that everything I tell you brings fulfillment and life to your life. Do you trust me? Do you trust me in this, in this intimacy of relationship? Because trust, right, is the ultimate form of intimacy in a relationship. Those you trust are those you feel the closest to. Those you distrust are those you, you have an offishness in that relationship. And so he's asking him, do you trust me? Or, Adam, do you distrust me? And you believe that the best way to get out of life is to live apart from me apart from a relationship with me, on your own, making your own decisions of what is good and what is right and what is moral and what is beneficial to you. So he asked that question. But really the question that he asked is a relational one. Do you love me? Do you trust me? And he says, if you eat of this fruit, you're going to die. So what does he mean by that? So a lot of times what we think of that is that you're going to physically die. You're going to breathe your last breath and that's it, no more. God is talking about something a little bit more than that because the word death in the Hebrew and the Greek means separation. That's what it means. So if you think about it, when you think about death, it means separation. So yes, if you physically die, your spirit is separated from your body. But what God is also getting at with Adam and with us as well is that there's also a death in a relationship, that there's a separation in this relationship. In fact, what we see in the very next chapter, in Genesis chapter 3, that Adam with his wife decide that God and believe and they distrust God and they think that God is, is holding back on them. And so wanting to be like God in their own selfishness and their own pride and to be able to, to make the rules themselves in the way that they think would benefit them, they decide to distrust God, eat the fruit, and, and go from there. And then what you see in the, in the fact that they wanted to be more like God, they became less like God. God who's good, who's love, who's peace and joy. Well, they became selfish, prideful. Uh, they began to blame one another. Hurt and pain came into the world because of their selfishness that happened to them. And so what you see here in, in that moment was this separation. So in Genesis 3.19, though, God says to, to Adam and Eve, he says, For you are made from dust, and from dust you will return. 
so that there is this physical death that is going to happen to you, that you will die physically. But even more so than that, he conveys to them that through this, there's been a death in our relationship, Adam and Eve, because you damage this relationship because you don't trust me. When we don't trust somebody, there's a damage in that relationship. Let me give you an example of this. Let me ask you a question. When you go out and about and you're downtown Orlando or wherever and you're walking about, do you just go up to people and give them high fives and, you know, and, and treat them as if you're their, their closest friend? No, you don't say anything to them. You know, maybe not even keep eye contact with them. There's no closeness to that in that relationship at, at all. You know why? Because there's damaged relationship, because of the pride and selfishness of man. We keep ourselves at guard from other people because we don't know whether they're going to hurt us or not. You ever had an offish relationship with somebody? Well, there's a separation in that relationship. There is a sense of death in that relationship that is separated. Okay, So, so God is talking to Adam and Eve about this, but he also says to them, but with that, there's also going to be a physical death as well. But there's a purpose to this physical death. Now, it seems kind of weird. Why would God have a purpose for death? Yeah, you say, well, maybe his purpose is for judgment. Maybe perhaps there's part of that as, as well. But we also see that even though that death is also a form of judgment from God, it's also a form of grace from God. And say, wait a minute, how in the world can, can death be grace and be a provision from God? Well, let's look at just another, uh, a, couple, a few verses down there in Genesis chapter 3, here in verse 22. And then, God's, and then the Lord God said, look, the human beings have become like us, knowing both good and evil. But here's the deal. They can't handle this. They will not make good, wise, loving choices. They're going to make self-centered uh, decisions based on this. So what if they reach out then and take the fruit from the tree of life and eat it? What happens? Well, then they will live forever. In other words, what, what the Lord is saying here is that, hey, if they continue to go on and live for eternity, they're going to live in eternity in their selfishness and their pride and their ego. And there's going to be so much damage, so much hurt and pain and all that damage and all that pain and all that hurt is just going to keep cycling through. It's never going to be broken as they live this way for all eternity. And God says there needs to be another way. And so in God's grace and his provision, he brings about death. Why? Because it's through death that he wants to bring about a resurrection, a new life, a better life, a hope of life that is that that uh, where there is no more pain or suffering caused by our own selfishness, pride, ego, hurt, the way that we hurt ourselves and the way that we hurt other people. So God desired for man to die in order to be raised to new life. And that's what Jesus did. That was the whole reason for Jesus and why he came into this world. Was he came into this world in order to die so that there can be a newness of life. That this cycle of selfishness and pride and ego and pain would be broken for us. That we can live life eternally the way that we were ultimately meant to live. In an intimate, trusting relationship with a God who loves us dearly. In fact, Jesus said this in John chapter 12 verse 24. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and it dies, it remains alone. In other words, it's just there. It just stays a kernel. It never becomes what it, it was ever meant for it to be. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Jesus was talking about his own life, that if, if he doesn't die, then everything is just the same. We all just continue going and suffering from our own sins, the the you know, the hurts and the pains and the hangups that we have in our life just continue to cycle through. But it's through my death and now through my resurrection, there is a new life. So that way when we die, so that when we die, we may have a new life. Just like a kernel, when it's buried, something else comes out of it. It comes, it becomes a plant. It, there's, there's fruitfulness to it. It becomes alive. And so the reason why God um, purpose that there would be death was that there, so that there would be a true resurrection and through the true resurrection that we can experience life to all its fullness. Now, you may still have the question, did Jesus really raise from the dead? Is there really eternal life? What's going on really deep down within your heart and your mind? Do you just kind of hope and, or, and, and, and I define that as in our way that we define it, do you just kind of wish that there is 
you know, an eternal life? Or do you know that there is an eternal life? And if you struggle over that, you're not alone. You, we go all the way back to the very early church. There were questions about Jesus. Did Jesus really raise from the dead? Is there really a resurrection and all of that sort of stuff? And Paul uh, answered a lot of these questions in one of his letters that he wrote uh, called 1 Corinthians. It was a letter that he wrote to a group of Christians in Corinth. And so what, this is what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning with verse 14 and then onward in verse 15. He, and he says this, so, so the question is, you know, did Christ really die, you know, raised from the dead? Maybe he did. Well, he says this, and if Christ has not been raised, he says, then all our preaching is useless. In other words, what Paul is saying, if Jesus Christ didn't raise from the dead, everything that I have said to you is absolutely foolish and is completely meaningless, okay? And so if he hasn't been raised from the dead, and here's the deal, not only that, but your faith is useless too. Your faith in, in the eternal life, your faith of being reconnected to those you love in Christ, is all of that is useless if he didn't uh, raise from the dead, and then he goes on, he says, and we apostles would all be lying about God for we have said that God raised Christ from the dead. In other words, as a pastor, I would be a liar as well. If there was no resurrection from the dead, I would just be lying to you guys. That there isn't any resurrection from the dead. Uh, everything that we said about the afterlife is meaningless and all of that sort of stuff. And then he goes on and he says, but here's the thing in verse 19. If Jesus Christ didn't raise from the dead, Think about us here. He says this, and if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we, the apostles, we, Paul, Peter, James, John, not only are we liars, but more than that, we should be pitied more than anyone in this world. Why should they be pitied? Paul has been beaten. He's been stoned. He's been shipwrecked. Um, he's lost out on probably a very lucrative life that he had as a, as a Pharisee before that. All of these things that, that he had to go through. And he, so because of following Jesus Christ. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, he's saying, you should be pitying us and all the things that we go through. And so then he goes on in verse 30, he talks about it just kind of, you know, and, and so why should we ourselves risk our lives hour by hour? In other words, he says, so why should I risk my life if Jesus didn't raise from the dead? For I swear, dear brothers and sisters, that I face death daily, every single day. Why in the world would I do that if Jesus didn't raise from the dead? This is as certain as my pride in what Christ Jesus our Lord has done in you. And so in verse 32, he goes and he says, And what value was there in fighting wild beasts, the people of Ephesus, if there will be no resurrection from the dead? Why bother? Why bother doing any of these things? And if Jesus Christ didn't raise from the dead, and if there is no resurrection, then you know what? Let's just be selfish consume, get the most that we possibly can for ourselves in this world. So let's feast and drink for tomorrow. We just, we die. That's it. And so Paul is saying, if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then let's just be, you know, let's just be as comfortable as we possibly can, live for ourselves as much as we possibly can. But Paul said this back in verse 20. He said, but here's the deal. But in fact, here's the truth. Here's the reality. Now remember, this is a guy who used to persecute the church. He used to have Christians um, put in prison. He had people killed because they were followers of Jesus Christ. But it was at the moment that he experienced himself, the resurrected Lord, that everything flipped, everything changed. The way that he thought about death changed and everything he thought about life changed. Everything he thought about God changed. And so he says, not in theory, not in just you know, uh, some message that he received from somebody else. But in fact, because of my own experience with my relationship with God and seeing Christ raised from the dead, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. And so he goes on in verse 21. He says, so you see, just as death came into the world through man with Adam, right? Going back all the way to Genesis chapter three, there was death. That there was, there was this physical death and there was this spiritual death, this physical separation and this, this relational separation between us and God. Now, the resurrection from the dead has begun through another guy, Jesus. That this other death, but not just through his death, but now through his resurrection, there can now be a, a time of where we are resurrected with a new body, 
that doesn't perish, that is eternal. And not only that, but we are also reconciled back into that loving, caring, trusting, intimate relationship with our God. And so he goes on in verse 22 and he says, just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam. What does he mean we all belong to Adam? Well, it's because we're all sinners. We're all selfish. We're all prideful. We're all um, partakers of this broken world. And we are all people who create in some form the brokenness of this world. Uh, and so being in Adam, we all die. Every single one of us is going to have a last breath unless Christ returns. We are all going to experience that. But here's the thing, and this is why we call it the gospel or the good news and why the good news is so much wrapped up in, in the understanding of Christ's death and resurrection. Because here, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. What's new life? Well, it's the opposite of death and separation. This new life, the fulfilled life, is now in reconciliation and in, in an intimacy of a relationship with our God. Instead of being separated, we come back together. And not only this new life, but we have this new eternal life by which God promises us to have a, a new body in this that never perishes, that's, you know, that um, never breaks down, um, that we will never have pain or suffering or hurt or be selfish or prideful or uh, um, experience any of the brokenness that comes from that. That there will be new life in that. But it's for everyone who belongs to Christ. Why is it only for those who belong to Christ? That seems very uh, exclusive. It's not exclusive because the invitation for Jesus Christ is for every single person on this planet. For seven billion people, God is saying, come to me. You come to me. And see, remember that death equals separation. So really, it, when, when we talk about belongs to Christ, that is, he's using really relational words there. That th those who are in relationship with him, because that's where life is. Life is only found in the one who sacrifices life for us, which is Jesus Christ. And it's all about coming back into that relationship with him. Now, here's the thing about this world. The world that we live in right now is broken. It's nothing that what it is ever meant to be. So in this world, the, and, and in the very best of this world, we get a, maybe a glimpse of what heaven is like. In the worst of this world, we only get a glimpse of what hell is like. Complete and utter separation from God and his goodness. So for us who are Christians, this present world is about the closest that we are going to get to hell. For unbelievers, those who are not connected to Christ and who desire to live eternity apart from a relationship with God, well, this is about as close to heaven as you're going to get. But here's the thing. God doesn't want you to be separated from him. He wants you to be with him because it's with him that there is real life and joy and peace. And that's why his offer and gift of salvation is, is inclusive to all who would receive that gift. But here's the thing. That gift, again, is not about you having eternal life. That gift is about you having an amazing relationship with a God who loves you forever. That's God's trajectory. That's his goal. Now, what does that mean for us to how we live now, right? Because we said how we think about death directly impacts the way that we think about life. Well, here's how it how it is. Paul wrote um, again to these same people in Corinth, a second letter uh, called 2 Corinthians. And in that, in chapter 5, he talks about death again. And just to give them encouragement because, you know, he, he uh, addressed the reality that these bodies are breaking down. They get worn out. They're slowly going to, to decay and there's going to be end of it. But he says, but be confident. You know, I'm confident in the promise and what God has guaranteed us uh, of eternal life with him forever with these new bodies. And he's given that guarantee through giving us his Holy Spirit. And so through that, though, he says this in um, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. But he says, here's where the goodness is. Yes, we are fully confident of the, what God has promised us. In other words, I don't second guess anything that God says. When God says it, man, I totally trust him. You see the difference between Adam and Eve who didn't trust him to now Paul who comes into this trusting relationship with God. And he says, yes, we are fully confident. And we would rather be away from these earthly bodies. Why? Because they break down, because they wear out. 
We get this world that we live in is very wearisome and all of that. For then we will be at home with the Lord. See where his trajectory is because he knows where life is. That life is found at being at home with the Lord. That the, the, that the, the anxiousness that we feel in this world, the offness that we feel in this world is because we're not at home. We're not at the place that we were supposed to be. That there is another place by which we will find satisfaction and fulfillment that we will be able to rest and go, this feels like home. And Paul is saying, we're not there. We're not there, but we're fully confident though that we're going there and we will be there. For then we will be at home. And this is where what makes home, the Lord makes it home to be with him. So he says, while we are here in this life that we have here. So whether we live here in this body or away from this body, our goal is to please him. Why? Because life in the fullness of life is found in him. So even in this broken world that we live in, and it's broken. A lot of times we think, oh man, it's just going to get better. No, it's not. We're just going to keep cycling through sin until God uh, fulfills all his promises for us. But here's the thing. We can have greater glimpses of heaven through developing an intimate relationship with God and developing an intimate relationship with each other and going into this world and serve them and to love them, even if it means giving up things and sacrifice things, to portray to the world the goodness of God so that those people in, within our community can have an amazing, beautiful, eternal relationship with God, that they too can also come home and be with the Lord who made them. So here's the thing. Let me ask you the question. As I finish up here, um, what, do you, what do you think about death, really? I mean, what's really going on inside of you? Not just kind of what you think you've heard in a Sunday school or even what I said. What, what, do you, what do you truly think about death? Because it will directly impact the way that you live your life. Because if you think that this is all there is or this is the best that it's going to be, you're just going to be a colonel. And there's not going to be any full life. There's going to be this need to, to self-preserve. There's going to be this need to consume. There's going to be a need to be willing to let other people sacrifice if it means for you to have better life here on this earth. You'll live that way. Or if you're willing to bury that, that kernel and bury your life in Christ so that God can raise you to a new life, then you will experience life life indeed, a fruitful life, an eternal life that God desires for you to have that will awaken you to having a joy in, even in the brokenness of this world, a confidence even as your, your body decays. Even though you may feel a sense of poverty in your pocketbook, a, there's a richness in the Lord. E, and even though there, may, you, there will become a time where we will face the reality of our last breath, there can be an intensity or an anticipation of what comes next. D.L. Moody once said this right before he died. He said this and he said, in a little while, you're going to hear rumors that I'm dead. But don't believe them. I'll be more alive than I've ever been before. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a great godly man of God, that while the, the German church uh, was fearful and self-preserving their own life under the Third Reich, was willing to, to speak up to what is truth about justice and what was good and what was all God was all about and found himself arrested by the Nazis and was ultimately um, murdered by the Nazis, he said this right before he was died. He said, this is the end, but no, for me, it's just the beginning. And so we see through history, those who have done the most in this world thought the most of the next. What do you think most of? Let me pray. Father, I thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ. Though in his life he was a colonel, but then through his sacrifice he was buried and through his resurrection there is new life. There's peace, joy. There is reconciliation of relationship with you. There's reconciliation with our brothers and sisters in Christ for all eternity and we're so grateful for that, God. God, I pray that you continue to work within our hearts and our minds the reality of your amazing, wonderful plan of giving us the better gifts than we can ever imagine in this world. Father, the best of this world is only a glimpse of the beauty and the grandeur that you are offering us for all eternity. 
And God, we see and we begin to experience as we move close to you, the grandeur of eternal life is just being in your presence and experiencing your deep and profound love deeply within our hearts and our minds. So Father, I pray that you too would move us beyond just being a colonel that is alone, that you would move us to being willing to die to our lives so we can become alive to you. It's in your son's name I pray, amen.